So I got the call on December 16th. It's the call that no one wants to get. And as a criminal defense attorney, when I see a good friend giving me a call past a certain time at night, I get worried. And unfortunately, in this particular situation, it was one of the absolute worst case scenarios. I'm here today to sit down and talk with a good friend of mine, Mike Kwiatkowski, who was at the scene of a murder when it all happened. And he's going to be sharing his story of A to Z. Here's, here's everything that went down. Here's the police investigation. We're going to give this video as long as it takes to go through it all. And um, it's, he's going to bring you through every step of the way of what it's like, God forbid, if you have to be there. So without further ado, let's get into it. So, Mike, I got the call from you that night on December 16th. Rather than me trying to paraphrase or do anything else, what happened? Well, I received a call earlier that night. I guess to back up ever so slightly, I'm a landlord. Got a number of rentals, and I got the call that every landlord loves getting in the dead of winter, the heat's out. And December 16th of 2016, there was a snowstorm. I First, it was already late at night. I believe... If memory serves, it was a weekend. And I had to get out to the building in a snowstorm, and I had to get a plumber out there. The building is hot water heat. Felt my way out there and almost went off the road once or twice getting there. Got in, and I met with my building manager. Uh, Jason was his name. And he had told me, thank God, the heat was only out in one apartment, which is a whole lot better than a three-story building. We went up to that apartment, the tenant was gone, and my plumber arrived, and we found frozen pipes. So he began working to unfreeze them, uh, my plumber and Jason, my manager. Jason was a cancer patient, and he had just gone through... I don't even know what type of surgery it was, but a pretty crazy surgery out in New York City. It was very normal. He would get tired, go and lay down, sleep for an hour or two, get back up, and start working again. And he couldn't really sleep nights. I'm not sure what medication he was on or if it was the pain, but he would sleep in one, two, maybe three-hour time blocks and just keep going like this the whole day. Well, we were working, and eventually Jason got tired. And he said, hey, I'm going back to my apartment. I need to sleep. Fine. Nothing unusual. Apartment in the same building? Yep, just down the hall. We were 20 feet away. Yeah, I was in one unit, and he was six units beyond that. So my plumber kept working, and... If you hand me a sharp screwdriver, I'm liable to hurt myself, so I just sat back and let them do the work. And then I remember I heard a bang, and then I heard another bang. And I looked over and toward the bathroom where the the pipes had come up through the bathroom. I don't understand the layout. And I figured that the plumber was just banging away on some pipes, the froze pipes. And he stuck his head out, and he said, Mike, that sounds like a gunshot. And it took me a second, but he's right. Uh, Banging on pipes doesn't create sonic cracks. And I didn't know what was going on at that point. And honestly, my first thought was I had another drunk in the building firing off a pistol. But all the same, something didn't seem right. So I slammed the door to the unit, locked it, and I ordered the plumber back into the bathroom and drew my own gun and covered the door. And just waited. And it was silent. Absolutely nothing. And then I heard footfalls and a door slam. And it sounded like doors going down the secondary staircase. Or excuse me, uh, foot, feet going down the secondary staircase. And another slam. And I waited a little while. And my plumber was beginning to freak out. And I said, look, just relax. I said, I need to go look into this. And I said, if there is a problem, I said, first, I'm going to come back. 
And I gave him a word. I said, if I don't say this word, pounding on the door, let me in. Um, don't open the door. Just call the cops. But if I don't say the word, no matter what I say, no matter what I do, don't open the door. And so I threw open the door to the apartment that we were in, had my gun down the hall, no one in the hall, and I made my way down. And eventually I reached Jason's apartment. And his door was ajar. And that man's door was never ajar. He was security conscious to the point of paranoia. I figured that, you know, it's his business. I never ask questions on that. But I looked down and there was a nickel shell casing. I knew enough, you know, don't touch this. But it was a Hornaday. Hornaday 9 mil. And I looked a little distance away and that secondary uh, stairwell that I mentioned was across from his apartment. And I looked and on the landing there was a second one. Hmm. And then I started looking around for bullet holes in the ceiling and in the walls. Uh, I, as you know, but the other viewers wouldn't, I cut my teeth in ugly housing. Not very high-end places. And my first thought was someone got good and liquored up. It's Christmas season. Had too much Christmas cheer, yanked a pistol and started firing. No holes anywhere. And I look back at Jason's door and I knocked. No answer. And I just, something shifted in me. And I pushed on the door and the door pushed back at me at about the same force. And I pushed on the door again, and the pushback was harder. And I just, there was a sick feeling I got. And I shouldered my way in, and there he was in the middle of the entry hallway, uh, face down, bleeding out. And I remember touching his neck and uh, there was nothing there. And by that time, a couple of other tenants started coming out of the hall, coming out of their apartments to see what was going on. I distinctly remember two of them. And the first one saw me with my gun out, and I remember yelling at him, get back in your blankety-blank apartment. Get back in your apartment. And the other one looked at me, and I said, we, we got to call the cops. And I remember being in his apartment and calling the police, 911, and we were on hold. You know, everybody talks about you call 911, you're put on hold. Um, when seconds matter, the police are minutes away. Yeah, here I am. Um, I think my manager has just been gunned down. His corpse is right there. And I'm on hold. And um, eventually I got through, started telling them what happened. And, you know, they did their best to keep me on the line as long as possible. And I handed my, they ordered me and I, I well, again, I wasn't thinking very straight, handed my phone to the tenant. I said, you just hold on to this. And I heard sirens and I thought, oh, great. Cavalry's finally coming. There was a snowstorm that night, and there were wrecks everywhere, and the police were on their way to a wreck. So I had run downstairs to let them in, and they weren't coming on that one. All the time with my uh, sidearm out and expecting around the corner, and I'm going to have something pointed at me. None of that. Got downstairs, waited, nothing. Went back upstairs. Oh, they're coming now, uh, the 911 dispatcher. And I remember running downstairs, and they showed up, and they showed up in grand fashion. Uh, I remember either, I didn't look closely, AR-15s, M-16s, tromping into the building, securing the place. And uh, then they, you know, you need to go back to your apartment. I said, I'm the owner. Oh, well, you need to be out of here. Okay. 
And then it was like a either a first year officer or a cadet. Who are you? You made the call? Yeah, I'm the one who found him. Well, all of a sudden they were very interested in me. Uh, confiscated my pistol, uh, took me to a, we had a second, we've got storage rooms on every floor. Uh, and these are large 30 by 30 rooms. Um, sat me down, kept me essentially segregated, sequestered from everybody and uh, asked me a lot of questions. And then uh, they, this is a suburb, so they called in the main city police because their homicide detectives were very familiar with homicides. The area where this building is located, while it has its issues, if they get five in a year, that's an amazing amount. They don't have a lot of experience with that. And that's not a judgment on them. That's just what they deal with. I was asked more questions and uh, eventually given my gun back and sent on my way. And that was the start of uh, a lot of sleepless nights and uh, additional questions and a lot of trouble. And somewhere in there, I remember you called me. Um, and I remember they were talking about the, the type of, of ammo in your gun and whether or not you could basically change your firearm to, to fire that ammo. I carry a 10 millimeter and he was shot with a nine millimeter. And I remember there was some question about whether I could have somehow shot him with my gun and, you know, to make it look like I couldn't have done it. And eventually that was tossed out, uh, but that had come up. And if anybody cares to try this at home, if you put a 9 millimeter cartridge into a 10 millimeter barrel, at least in the Glock Model 40, it'll fall right through. So they, they treated you not only as a suspect, but of course as the lead suspect, which to be clear, I'm, I'm not trying to beg on the police for doing that. No. You were literally the only person to basically they had. I was the last one to see him alive and the first one to find him dead. What happened to the plumber during this? He, <laughs> it almost turned into a double homicide. He uh, decided to leave the safety of that apartment, was sneaking around the building trying to find a side way out. And as I'm heading down to let the police in with my gun drawn, uh, he decided to come right ar running right around the corner and almost right into me. Uh, that nearly ended poorly for both of us. Which just goes to obviously all the situational awareness issues and all that kind of stuff when your adrenaline's pumping. And um, so he wasn't there to vouch for you during the police questioning or did he hang around? He left. And I, during the questioning, they asked who I was with. And I mentioned his name and number. And it's my understanding that they paid him a visit and clarified everything, you know, confirmed that I was not involved. But that was essentially the last time I spoke with him, uh, even though he was not, he was my plumber, but he didn't work for me. Uh, he was a guy doing side work. He never accepted any further work from me after that, and I can't say I blame him. What, uh, I mean... And there's more we can talk about, which maybe we shouldn't as far as the specifics of the investigation, because obviously we, we want the police to nail this guy. Uh, it's been seven years, and uh, for the record, he has not been caught. Right. What lessons did you take out of this, if, if any? And, or what lessons would you want the folks down the lens to, to carry home with them? The first thing is you're always going to fall to your lowest level of training. I had a modicum of training. I've mentioned that I'm a retired firearms dealer, and I can tell you a lot about different types of firearms, um, but that's not training in use. You know, taking apart a Vickers gun is very different than 
a defense of gun use. So the first thing I would say is always remember you're going to fall to your you're going to default to your lowest level of training in a high stress incident like that. And if you don't have any formal training, just because the thing's on your belt doesn't mean you know how to use it outside of a range. The second thing is I did make one mistake, and that was I was very open and talked with the police. And that isn't to say that I'm telling you not to help them, but if I would have been smart, I would have waited for you. And at that time, you and Jen were, pardon, let's back up, caught that, you and your spouse were out and at some holiday gathering. It's Christmas time. And you weren't able to call back for a while. And instead of holding tight, I started talking about things that happened. Now, it worked out in the end. I'm here. Uh, as you know, I still regularly work with, buy, do things with firearms. I'm not a prohibited possessor. I certainly had nothing to do with this homicide. But that could have ended very badly if they truly wanted to try to pin things on me. And thankfully, they knew that I had nothing to do with this. The third thing is that I've yet to hear of anybody ever say after a defensive or ugly situation that they wish they would have had a smaller gun with a lower capacity. People still say BS on me when I say that I carried a long slide Glock 10 millimeter. I, I can vouch for that. He did. I did not for a moment wish that I had something with a, you know, some, some 32 or 38 revolver with a five shot capacity and a snub nose barrel. Always carry the largest firearm that you can safely and competently use. I'm not saying that you need to run around with a, I forget the official nomenclature, but essentially a sawed off G3 into a pistol. But if you've got the option between a small 380 and a 9mm, um, unless there's a really valid reason, you take the 9mm. And if you've got the option between a 9mm and something larger, again, unless there's a valid reason, you cannot handle it, you don't trust the gun, go with the largest you can safely carry and competently handle. I'd also say that People talk about truck and trunk guns. I was up on the third floor. Yeah, I had something in the back of my Camry. That did me a whole lot of good up on the third floor. If you don't have it on you, it's meaningless at best. And at worst, it's bait for a car thief or someone breaking in. I that rifle would have been really helpful and comforting. It's useless in your trunk. If your problem's on the third floor, if my problem were on the third, first floor, it's still worthless. All that mattered was what was on me. I had my pistol, one in the chamber, and a 15-round magazine. That's all I had. I could have had any number of things in that trunk. It's meaningless. The last thing I'll say, if you go through stuff like this, it's going to mess with your head. Soldiers get training. They got people to talk with. Police get training. They have someone to talk with. I spent a lot of nights awake and uh, I got sort of better, and then an incident happened a little while later, which if you're a landlord, it can occur, brought it all back to the surface. Yes, I needed some help. I needed to see a shrink, and there's no shame in that. Um, if you're, You may well end up needing to talk with someone. No shame in it. Get the help. 
you know, I, from seeing Jason on the floor and then within a week, my then business partner and I are at his funeral and they've got his body kind of adjusted in the casket because he took one in the armpit and one in the head and they needed to hide some things. I mean, the morticians did what they could. There's no harm in seeking help and yeah, it screwed with me. Something that I also wanted to talk about, and thank you for sharing all those um, difficult and personal experiences. Um, Something that else kind of struck me when you and I were talking about this, and you and I have spent a lot of time talking about this um, over the years. It still bothers me. Something that I think the viewers most of them won't know was you as you know you mentioned that you cut your teeth in will be politically correct and call it class d uh housing which is code for hood not very nice right rough ugly areas and then myself as an ex-prosecutor criminal defense attorney something that you and i both seized on as being very unusual was the fact that the shell casings were something that was a high quality product. And that's not impossible to come across or encounter randomly in the hood or on the street or something like that, but that's by no means the usual. Can you expand on that at all for folks? I have seen and encountered a lot of weird and ugly scenarios as a landlord and helping other landlords before I became one. And generally speaking, the firearms you see among the criminal element and problem children, they're not high quality. I don't know if if people don't have experience with not just that, but going to a police auction where they're auctioning off the confiscations, the turn-ins, things like that. They are not running around with HKs. They're not running around with SIGs. They're barely running around with Rogers. Um, And this is very much dependent on where you live in the country. I used to live in Arizona. My time out there had a big impact on my life. But I remember going and seeing the police confiscations when they came out. And the highest end gun that you would find would be a high point. And in the area in Arizona where I lived, it was very, it was a very poor area. And a high point was a legitimate working man's gun in that area. You go to other parts of the country, that's nothing but a throwaway junker, et cetera. So you're going to find a lot of junk And you'll also find a lot of, certainly stolen guns, but odd sawn-offs, rifles and shotguns. They have a, there is no finish unless you count rust as a finish. They may have had some corrosive ammo through them uh, and never been cleaned. These things are never cleaned, period. And the ammo is usually whatever is cheapest or on sale. And I'm sure you've heard of people buying Lucy's, that is, individual cigarettes. I've run into situations where they're selling ammunition by the bullet. And it's not high-end stuff. At best, it's high-end might be your basic target ball ammo. That would be very high-end. And sometimes these things have so much corrosion on them, you wonder how they even get at the chamber. So to me, to notice those, that it was the Hornaday nickel cases, um, there are a lot of theories which I can't get into surrounding why Jason was murdered. But somebody, if you'll pardon the phrase, cared to send the very best. And that's quite unusual. Well, we appreciate you coming in and... Hopefully people can learn something from this experience so that there can be, I don't want to say a slight bit of good, but maybe we can, we can get whatever we can out of it to reduce the amount of 
unnecessary evil or preventable evil that that we can out there. I believe some good can come out of it. It happened. It's done. Certainly, if anybody out there has any information about the murder of Jason Hubacher, um, please, you know how to reach me, and we'll be giving my link. I'll forward that immediately to the investigating department. But if someone else, and there will be people, other people who either have been through this and maybe are having the trouble and nightmares, staying awake, staying, not falling asleep, or somebody who's going to go through this in the future, first, it's okay to ask for help. But second, before it happens, consider what I said, weigh it. If it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. But if it does, use it before you need it and learn it before you need it. Well, thanks, Mike, for coming in. Thank you. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content, and we'll see you in the next one.